Well, let's begin by, again, re uh, reading the text. It's only just two verses from Galatians 5. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, Paul writes, But the fruit of the Spirit, okay, that which he produces in the life of a believer, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Well, as you'll recall, last week we were looking at the religious affections. And remember that that is a book that Jonathan Edwards wrote in response to a particular minister who was criticizing the Great Awakening. He, as he looked at what was going on, he said, you know, this is nothing more than just emotionalism uh, at best. But he said, it may also be the work of the devil. And there were a number of people, and uh, Dr. Godfrey told us about 25% of the clergy of New England uh, agreed with this minister, which means the majority thought it was a work of God, but there was still a significant minority. But the book was written in order to warn this minister to answer his book, actually, and to warn these others who agreed with him that they were getting perilously close to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, we need to be careful here because Edwards did not say they were blaspheming the Spirit, but he says this is getting very close to it. And what he meant by that is this, because we need to remember what the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit really is. Remember when Jesus told the Pharisees who saw him casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit, but then accused him of doing these things by the power of the devil, that they had committed it. Now that is the clearest example we have of what the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. It's when somebody knows the Spirit of God is at work, but because of their hatred of Jesus, because of their hatred of God, attribute that to the devil instead. Now as you can see, Edwards sees that going on uh, in these criticisms against the Great Awakening. Now Edwards agreed that the devil was at work in that revival that the devil was pushing things to an extreme, uh, trying to, to stop the revival from moving forward and to bring it into discredit. But Edwards wanted to point out the Spirit was also at work. There were things that were being done in the revival that the devil would never do. You know, we always talk about these counterfeits that the devil has. He can counterfeit a lot of what are called the signs of, or marks of grace. Well, this is one thing the devil would, you know, he really can't counterfeit, and he wouldn't if he could, because the devil's really not in the business of making people love God and turning them to Jesus Christ. And that was happening in the revival. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. So Edwards is saying, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, there are things there that are bad, but the Spirit of God is at work. And you cannot attribute all of these things to the devil. Now, in pointing out, again, the Spirit's work, Edwards also shows us what the Spirit does in the life of a true believer when he causes us to be born again. He not only gives us a conviction that the gospel is true, but he gives us a love for that gospel. And that love is what... Edwards calls religious affections. And really, I suppose when you understand the meaning of his book, it really should be the religious affection rather than affections because there's really only one. Now, let me just review a bit from what we saw last week when we, you know, as we seek to understand what affection actually is. Remember that God has given to our souls that immaterial part of us two different powers, two different abilities, two different faculties. He's given us the ability to think. You know, we can collect information through our senses, we can analyze those things, we can draw conclusions. By the way, Edwards also believed we could reason certain things out uh, just from pure reason. But we have the ability to think. You know, we can use our imagination and we can see things, we can deduce things. But he's also given to us a second ability, and that is the ability to desire certain things. To either 
desire or choose, or I should say wants, what it is our souls see in our, in our understanding, you know, what our imagination sees, and choose that. Or to reject and hate what it is that we see. You know, Edward said that that is the heart. And when it's exercised in choice, that is the will. Now, these desires in and of themselves are not affections, but affections are strong desires. Strong desires for God and for the things of God are what he calls religious affections. Okay, religious affections. And that is what he says Christianity is really all about. Uh, last week, um, I read this. The things of religion, this is a quote from Edwards, the things of religion are so great that there can be no suitableness in the exercises of our hearts to their nature and importance unless they be lively and powerful. In nothing is vigor in the actings of our inclinations so requisite as in religion. And in nothing is lukewarmness so odious. So what he's saying here is the Spirit of God, when he causes us to be born again, not only gives to us an affection, but it's a religious affection, a love for God. And being an affection, it's a very strong love for God. Um, and he says, you know, the, the things of, of religion, and what he means by religion, of course, is the true faith. They are so vitally important that we really can't just be... Um, you know, nonchalant about them, uh, you know, just be a little bit interested in them, but we really need to have a, a zeal and a great interest in these things and to have the opposite, as we were reminded in Revelation 3.15, is something that is really dishonoring to the Lord. Now, Edwards has already given to us, a, I think, a very important spiritual shot in the arm. We really do need to hear these things, but there's really a lot more in the book, a lot more of God's wisdom. So I, I want us to spend a little bit more time in it, not just this week, but maybe in the next couple of weeks. And this morning, what I'd like us to do is to consider what he has to say about the source of all religious affections, that they all flow from the one source or love. So I want us to see four things, and I tried to put them as simply as I could. Maybe we can hold on to these. The Christianity, true religion, is all about love, okay? The kind of love the Spirit gives. That that love is powerful, that that love is always at work, and that that love is the source of all of the affections, all of the religious affections, okay? Everything that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. So those are the four points. So first of all, Christianity is really all about love. Now remember that Jesus has told us, and we've looked at this recently in the past, that the main thing that God wants from us, the most important thing, um, remember when the lawyer asked Jesus about what the greatest commandment was? Jesus gave us that which was most important. In Matthew um, chapter 22, verses 34 through 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Now, this, Jesus really is telling us here, this is the most important thing in the Christian faith, is that we love God. Now, the second most important thing Jesus goes on to say is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. So what is, what, you know, what is God concerned about? What is the most important thing to him? It is that we love him and that we love those who are in his image. But again, notice love. Love is what summarizes Everything God requires in the Old Covenant. And Paul tells us it's also everything he requires in the New Covenant as well. And it shouldn't surprise us because really the New Covenant is the fulfillment of the Old. Paul writes in Romans 13 verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. 
And he says in verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. You know, God wants us to love because he wants us to be like him. Okay? He is love. Remember what John writes, God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By the way, you know, we used to read that passage and we say, well, you know, people focus on love so much. You know, God is much more than just love. I mean, God's also justice, and he has many other attributes. He hates sin. But really, all of those things, even as it's true of us, that everything that should be true of us flows out of love, the same thing is true about God. The fact that he is love makes him to be a God of justice, makes him to be a God who hates sin, makes him to be a God who must punish sin because love, the kind of love God has, which is a love for what is good and right and pure and holy, moves you to do these things. So the point is, God is love and he wants us to be like him. So he gives to us this love and he commands us to love. Now again, this, as I pointed out before, this isn't the kind of love that the world thinks about. You know, they think if they, if they love in the way that, that they would like to love, that they're actually doing what God commands, at least those that have some knowledge of what the Bible says. But that isn't at all true. This kind of love is the kind of love that God has. And we've seen how Paul explains that love in 1 Corinthians 13. Let me just review again verses 4 through 7. Love is kind, or excuse me, is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness. I mean, that really describes... Rejoicing in unrighteousness describes the, the love of the world, but rejoices with the truth, rejoices in righteousness, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Really, even as it is in God, so it is in us. The desire for what is good and right is that which also makes us hate what is wrong. Remember how Paul tells us in the opening verses of this chapter that if we do anything for God that is not done in love, which means it has a different motive, it makes it odious in God's sight. God hates it and he will not accept it. It must be done in love. So the point of the first point is true Christianity, true religion is all about love. It's all about affection, the affection of love, and remember that love is a very, very powerful thing, and that's the second point. This love is powerful. Now, let me, again, uh, let me read something that I also read last week that I think bears repeating here, something that Edwards wrote in his Religious Affections. He says this, that religion which God requires and will accept does not consist in weak dull and lifeless wishes, raising us but a little above a state of indifference. God in his word greatly insists upon it that we be good in earnest, fervent in spirit, and our hearts vigorously engaged in religion. Now, really, I think that comes across in the things we've already read in the previous passages. Remember what Jesus said that God wants from us most of all? He wants us to love him, but how much, right? With all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, basically with everything we have to love, and he wants us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And Paul points out that there's really nothing that we, humanly speaking, love more than ourselves. You know, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. So husbands are to love their wives as themselves, you know, because they love themselves so much. Well, we are to love our neighbors. We love ourselves, although we realize we are to love our wives in a different way. And that's to be a stronger love. But we still get the point. Love God with all you have to love and love your neighbor as yourself. It's not enough to love God a little 
to give him a little, to give him a little time, to give him a little of our resources, but we need to love him with everything that we have, with our whole being. And it's not enough, as uh, James reminds us and John does as well, to have kind thoughts toward our neighbor. If we see them in need to say, you know, be warm and be filled, but do nothing to help them, we must love them as we love ourselves. Now, we know that this is not something that we could do on our own. But we can, by God's grace, with the help of the Holy Spirit, because this is the kind of love the Spirit actually gives. We, we must, we will see within ourselves something of, of a desire to do these things. You know, Augustine, who is the great theologian of the fourth century, who saw a number of things that really um, sort of, what do you want to say, anticipated John Calvin and, and the Protestant Reformation in many ways, although he also anticipated just about you know, a number of things that the Roman Catholic Church also holds to. But he was right in this when he wrote this. Uh, it's a prayer that he wrote down in his confessions. He said, Lord, give what you command and command what you will. And in that brief prayer, he was recognizing uh, what the new covenant was really all about. Okay, and the old covenant was, Lord, command what you will, and I'll, I'll try to obey it as best I can. That's the way it was for most of the Jews, as we understood, because most of them were unconverted, even though the blessings of the new covenant were going backwards. The vast majority of the Israelites did not know God. But the blessing of the new covenant is, the Spirit of God writes the law in our hearts, giving us the power to do it, and when God commands us, then we can do it because that's what we want to do. It. The only thing that was stopping us before was the lack of desire. So then, again, listen to what Augustine says. Give what you command. Give me the, the blessing of the new covenant, the, the love for righteousness. And then command what you will because then I will carry it out. The blessing of the new covenant is God gives us a son. And Jesus, through his work, gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit, in His work, gives us the power to do what God commands by working this love in our hearts. Give what you command, love. That's what He commands, is love. Give that love. And then command what you will. What He commands us to do is love. I, I hope you see the, the point there. He gives us love, and then He commands us to love. Now, we understand the Spirit doesn't make us perfect right away, but He does give us the desire to love perfectly so that we grow in that love more and more each day. So love is what Christianity or true religion is all about. That love is a very powerful love. It's a very strong love. That's what affections are. They are strong desires. But thirdly, Edwards would tell us this love is always at work. It's not something that just happens now and again or just once in life, but it's something that's continuous. Now, we know, I'm sure, well, I, I, I would say Edwards would know this, but this wasn't happening in his day because it didn't exist. But we know that there are those who go forward at an altar call to receive Jesus. Remember, the, the classic example is Billy Graham, you know. In a Billy Graham crusade, you, you would have an altar call after each of his messages, and there would be thousands of people that would flood the, the podium in the middle of the stadium, and they would pray with him to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. But Billy Graham's organization knows through their statistics that only 2% of those people continue with, with the Lord after that, actually get plugged into churches and serve the Lord. And let me just mention one other statistic that out of, out of uh, I should say, uh, out of that 2%, something like 90% of those people were witnessed to by a believer over a period of time and invited to the crusade by a believer, okay, which means that they were, they were having this example and they were having this continual witness and perhaps the gospel explained to them. So it may not have been, you know, Billy, Billy Graham, that the Spirit was working through him, but they thought they had to come forward. But the point is, many seem to express a love for Christ by praying to receive Him, 
that don't really love him and don't follow through. Most of these actually fall away. And we know that there are many people who, when they fall into life-threatening situations, you know, the, the uh, what do you call it, the, the trench conversion, you know, when you're in warfare and you think you're going to die and you cry out to the Lord uh, for his mercy, just please save me and I'll love you and serve you the rest of my life. And, and then when the danger's gone, they, well, I guess I don't need him after all, you know, and they just kind of go on their merry way. That is not what the work of the Spirit of God does. He gives a love that permanently changes our lives. Let me read to you a portion of 1 John, perhaps one of the most convicting books or letters in the Bible. 1 John 3, verses 5, 5 through 10. He says, You know that He, that is Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins. You know, not just the guilt of sin, but the power of sin. And in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him sins. And let me just again remind you, that can be a very alarming statement because we know that we all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth isn't in us, right? That's what John says at the first part of his letter. So he's not contradicting himself here, but what he's saying is no one who abides in Him practices sin. No one who sins or practices sin has seen Him or knows Him Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. You see, if Christ has come into the life, the devil is going out. The works of the devil are going out. He destroys that work. He sets us free in, so that we can now obey Him and serve Him because, again, that's what our heart dictates. So He appeared to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin or he cannot practice sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not Practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. And again, Edward's point and John's point here is that if we have this love, we won't just do what's right, we won't just love just now and then, but we'll do it constantly, we'll do it all the time because the Spirit of God is constantly at work in our hearts. Now, so... Again, Christianity can be summarized by love. It's a powerful love. It's a love that works constantly, continuously. But then here is the, really the, the Edwardsian point that I think um, maybe we don't often think about. That love is really the source of all the affections. Edwards would tell us it is the only affection. All the rest of these things are just simply expressions of love. So... What we've just looked at, I think we're, we're fairly familiar with those things. You certainly are if you've been here very long. But as John Gerstner said about Jonathan Edwards, he never, when he's answering you know, a question, he never just gives the expected answer. He always says something new and fresh. Well, what he tells us in the religious affections is that love, this is one of many things, love is not simply an affection. Love is all of the affections because all of them flow out of love. Again, think of what our passage says. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Edwards is telling us that what he thinks Paul means here is this, that when God gives us his Holy Spirit and the Spirit gives us this, this love, the Spirit, at the same time, gives us all these affections. It's really a package. It's a package deal. You have them all or you have none of them. Now, let me try to explain what he means by this. And he, he, I think in this explanation, this doesn't explain all the different ways in which it does it, but at least some of the ways, okay? So, first of all, he would say, if we have this love, we also have joy, okay? 
Joy, he would argue, is, is something we experience when we have what it is we desire. You know, and if you have this love the Spirit of God gives you, what is it that you desire the most? You, well, you desire God, don't you? Having this love in your heart for God shows you that you do have this relationship with Him. That we have Him, we know we have Him because we are loved by Him. Remember what John writes in 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. If, if we actually love God for his holiness, that means that we are loved by God. And that means we have this relationship and that gives us joy, okay? So this love produces joy. Now he says if we have this love, we also have peace. Having what we want the most, which is this relationship with God, gives to us what he would call a, a sweet contentment of soul. You know, the, the, the worry, the anxiety, the, the fear, the concerns that we have that all is not well is no longer there. We know that we are His and that He is ours. We know that He will keep us forever. We no longer have to be worried. Um, actually, we're going to see that um, we know that He's going to work everything in our lives out for good. We can, we can have perfect peace, as the uh, psalmist says. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you. As we understand all that God is and all that he has for us, it, it takes away all the anxieties and fears of life and gives to us a perfect peace. Now, patience is something we can also experience through love, and this perhaps is related to what we've just seen. If we have peace knowing that we belong to God and belonging to Him, we know that we have the promise that whatever happens to us in life is sovereignly in His hands and these are hands that love us, then we can patiently endure whatever He brings into our lives because we know that whatever we have to go through he means it for our good, that we may grow in his likeness. And we know that whatever happens to us, he will never let go of us. You know, sometimes it can be hard to endure the things we have to endure as Christians. And, you know, if you haven't gone through any of those trials, <laughs> I don't know if I can say that if anybody even knows what it's like not to have a life full of trials. You know what a great blessing it is to... Um, to have this promise and to know that there's light at the end of the tunnel, that, that God is, is going to work this for good, that I'm, we're going to be better at the end of the trial than we were before. And knowing that's true helps us to patiently endure it because we know that God is at work in these things. So love that shows us that we belong to God, shows us these promises belong to us, that he's going to do these things for us and so we can have peace and we can have patience. Now, Edwards tells us that kindness and goodness also come from love. Actually, you know, those are kind of like synonyms, aren't they, for love? Because that's how love is expressed, through goodness and kindness. God shows his love uh, through acts of kindness. Uh, when we love, we, we do the same thing. That, that's how we show it. Love always wants what's best for those whom we love. And so we show them kindness and we show them goodness. It flows out of love. Faithfulness also flows out of love. If we love God, we won't want to abandon Him. We'll want to hold on to Him. So that's what faithfulness is, is continuing with God, no matter what, what the difficulties. If we love Him, we'll also want to please Him. And so we will obey Him. From the heart, by the way, when we obey all the time, you know, if that's the pattern of our lives, what do we call that? We call that faithfulness, okay? So faithfulness also comes out of love. And gentleness, okay? How can we not be gentle with those whom we love? You know, if we're trying to express kindness to somebody and we're, we're harsh, I mean, those two are contradictory. Gentleness is simply an attribute of love. 
Uh, that was one of the things that made Jesus so appealing, is that he wasn't harsh when he spoke to everyone, but rather he spoke in a, in a gentle way. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. He was gentle. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. And then finally, self-control. Edwards points out that love makes us want to honor the objects of our love, right? We want to honor them. We want to dishonor them. We want to offend them. We want to honor God and we want to honor our neighbor. Now, one of the ways in which we honor God and our neighbor is we make sure we don't do the things that offend them. And to do that, we have to exercise self-restraint. But that's what self-control is all about, isn't it? is making sure that none of those negative things come out, you know, but rather that you exhibit those positive things that, you know, those attributes of love that we read about in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, Edwards goes on to say, as I've already mentioned before, that love also gives to us a hatred of the things that aren't loving, a hatred of sin, because sin is the opposite of all the fruits of the Spirit. So let me just give to you now a summary of, of really the fourth point, okay, which is that love is all the affections. Love it really summarizes everything. It produces everything. It produces all these affections. It produces all the, the sort of you know, affections or negative things, the, the hatred of all the negative things. But this is what Edwards writes. By the way, you'll notice from religious affections, you've heard a number of these things coming from me before. Where do you think I found them? Okay. It's, it is a challenging book, but it's definitely worthwhile um, if, if you read it. But this is what he writes. He says, from a vigorous, affectionate, and fervent love to God will necessarily arise other religious affections. Hence will arise an intense hatred and abhorrence of sin fear of sin, and a dread of God's displeasure, gratitude to God for His goodness, complacence and joy in God when God is graciously and sensibly present, and grief when He is absent, and a joyful hope when a future enjoyment of God is expected, and fervent zeal for the glory of God. And in like manner, from a fervent love to men will arise all other virtuous affections toward men. I, I hope you can see the point here. Love is the source of all the religious affections. And remember that true religion, true Christianity, is all about love. So let me close with this applicational point. And by the way, all of this is really applicational. But this last point, if we want to see more of these religious affections, if we want to see more of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives, then we need to strengthen that first fruit, don't we? We need to have a stronger love. If we want to have a stronger love, we need more of the Spirit's gracious influence. And we can only get that by spending more time walking with God, more time in communion with God. You know, one thing that was true of our Lord Jesus Christ was that He lived every moment of His life in, in conscious communion with the Father, loving Him, glorifying Him, doing everything He did for His honor and praise, and He did nothing that He didn't see the Father doing. Well, he did that because he was filled with the Spirit above measure. And, you know, his, his zeal, his, his, his heart was simply to honor his Father. Essentially, if, if we would be more like Jesus Christ, that's what we need to do. And I should say, you know, Jesus spent time in prayer. He spent, certainly worshipped in, in the synagogue every, um, every Sabbath. Uh, he did all that God commanded him. Okay? So all of these things go into what the Spirit of God is actually moving us to do. And we need to yield to the Spirit, walk with the Spirit, and do these same things in our lives 
spend time with God, walk with God, have this communion with God, do all that we do for His honor and glory. And as we do, our love for Him will grow. The more we spend time with Him, the more we'll be like our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really what we all desire. Again, by the Spirit of God working in our hearts, that's what we want. That's what our Lord wants. The greatest commandment will be fulfilled in us. You know, who walk not by the flesh, trying to keep the law in our own strength, but who walk by the Holy Spirit, who have that new heart, that new desire, and who give in to it and who yield to it and who live by it. So may the Lord help us to grow in that love. Let, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to, to have that communion with Him uh, through those various ways that we might grow in love.